a question for you. Did you find the story disturbing? The gospel passage. Of all the texts from the New Testament that pastors have for which to preach, I would say this is probably in the top five of passages you'd rather not have. Because how do we get to explain Jesus' initial reaction to this Canaanite woman? Okay, of course. Hundreds and hundreds of years there were hostility between the Canaanites and the Israelites. But this woman is not a danger. She's not a threat. She needs help. Why the silent treatment? Why did he say, I didn't come for you? I only came for the children of Israel. Why did he even use a statement that sounds like he's humiliating her? What the heck is going on? before he finally applauds her faithfulness. We're going to delve into this, but let me first say what it is not. And in saying what it is not, I'm also saying in the past, I've preached from this passage and said something that's not supported by the passage. Jesus was not testing her. Jesus was not seeing was she really faithful or just looking for a miracle. That's not what was going on. What is going on is the question that believers have had to face through the last two millennia. How wide is God's mercy? How wide is God's mercy? It's a downtown congregation. Thriving, flourishing. Some of the members have been part of this congregation for generations. In fact, some people would say this is really not your home until you have two or three generations in the church cemetery. <laughs> and some of the congregation are recent arrivals, particularly young adults who have moved into condos in the city because they like the culture and the arts and the nightlife. And on this one Sunday at this historic church building, the people showed up and found a homeless man asleep on the church steps. Long hair, beard, unkept, a bedraggled look about him. He wore an army jacket that had mixed fumes of body odor and alcohol. Empty wine bottle by his hand. There is a bowl there that he used for begging and a cardboard sign that has printed his request for help. Some of the members, when they arrived, gave it a wide berth before they went up to the steps. Some just frowned and shook their heads, spoke to the ushers about maybe calling the police to move the man on. Some came over to the bowl and dropped in some coins or dollar bills. One, one person even walked a block up the street to the McDonald's at one of those breakfast, sausage, egg, whatever, and uh, brought it back with a cup of coffee and put it by the person. Well, wouldn't you know it, about the time when this worship service started, the music, the singing, he kind of got up and got his burger and went inside. 
And again, one usher thought, I, I, I think we need to move him outside. <laughs> but the other usher said, well, why don't we just put him over there in the corner where the ushers usually sit out of the way. Throughout the service, he was agitated up and down. One point even tried to take a little nap on the puke. But wouldn't you know it, about two-thirds of the way through, he got up, and before the ushers noticed it, he's walking up the side aisle, catching a lot of stairs. And, and at about the time he rounded the corner to the front, the organist stopped. The people stopped. They were all staring at this homeless man, this outsider inside their church worship service. Well, it was a bit warmer on the inside. The man took off his jacket. He thought about taking off his cap and then took off his wig and the false beard, and guess who it was? Their pastor. Now, now the pastor in his sermon did not scold the people at all. He talked about the challenge we have in understanding how we are to extend God's mercy. It's not easy to help in the way that God wants the person to be helped. But it's also not easy when the outsider becomes an insider. When those boundaries put in place because of our tradition, our practices, and sometimes even our prejudices are trespassed by a Canaanite woman, an outsider who wants to be inside. Now some thoughts about this passage. Matthew was writing to a community of believers who were Jews who became disciples of Jesus. And they understood the Jewish heritage that they now embraced. And they said it was just as much their heritage as the heritage of those who were still rabbinic Jews. This heritage of Abraham, the law, and the prophets. This heritage that begins where God's saying to Abraham, from you and your descendants, I'm going to make a chosen people. And this chosen people, I'm going to send into the world to bring a blessing to all the people. Yes, all the people. But as Moses gives the law to try to form a community. We go through the season of judges and kings where again and again and again the chosen people went after idols instead of being true to their identity. But the later prophet said, God is sending the anointed one. And the anointed one is going to help you come into a right relationship with God and out of that relationship, a right relationship with other people. God is going to forgive sins. God is going to create community. God's mercy is going to prevail. And Jesus, yes, who is God, but is also human, understood his calling as to be the one to bring the children of Israel these Jews who are faithful 
into an understanding of their calling. And so Jesus and the disciples have left the region of Galilee where they were nagged at, criticized by the Pharisees, and they went into the land of Canaan about a 40 mile walk away where Jesus was helping them get ready for the trip to Jerusalem and what will follow. It was a retreat, a time of loan according to their plans. This woman breaks into it. The timing is all off. She didn't fit into the plan. And she's calling for help. And that initial response is, wait a minute, my, my ministry is to the children of Israel and you're not a child of Israel. You just might be a person looking for a miracle. And then she says what? Lord. She realizes he is the anointed one, the one sent by God. And Jesus affirms the wonder of her faith being expressed and brings healing. And then later, at the end of the story, Jesus, before the ascension, before the change of his appearance, tells what to his disciples. Now it's your turn to go to the outsiders of the world, telling them about the gospel, of God's grace prevailing over human sin, of faith, not works, being the way you receive this gift. about the community of loving God and loving neighbor. Go and make this happen. The church in Charlotte, North Carolina was one of those church plants in the late 1950s that got nestled into a neighborhood across, uh, out of the way of any main road. And it had an initial growth and then stagnated. A new pastor arrived in the late 60s, and he thought a way to keep the kids was to have a new kind of worship service that would still be liturgical but use different instruments. And, and a new liturgy had just been written. It was called the Chicago Folk Liturgy. And, and part of my uh, nurturing in the faith was that liturgy. And so, as a way to keep the youth active in the church, they started an 8 o'clock worship service. Now that's something in itself that you'd expect kids to show up at 8 o'clock in the morning, but that's a different story. And, and, and it had electric guitar, and it had snare drums, and it had bass guitar, and it had some vocalists, and they sang tunes that were very different. And not only did those kids attend, many others did. In fact, so many kids attended, they were sitting on the aisles. They were sitting around the altar. They were sitting any space they could find. But there was a problem. How many of you had something in your closet at one time? that was called your Sunday best. Rick, let me see the hands, what you know is Sunday best. Okay, you know what I'm talking about. Guess what? These Canaanites who showed up came in shorts, t-shirts, sandals, and the guys had ball caps. And the music was I heard one pastor call the devil's instruments. It was not church music. And so there was a church meeting to talk about what was going on. These Canaanites raiding our space. At that meeting, 
There was a woman close to 70, head of the altar guild, grew up in Sweden, high liturgy, really loved taking care of the altar and all of the gestures and movements that come. She loves organ music, and she rose to speak. And the people thought they knew what she was going to say. And she began by saying, Jesus said, bring the children to me and don't keep them from coming. And although she doesn't understand the music, does not comprehend the lyrics, she does know these High school kids and college students are coming to hear the gospel. And starting this Sunday, she's going to be at the door to greet every one of them when they arrive. We have said our mission, our vision of what God wants us to do is to turn our sacred space into common ground. And at this juncture, we really don't know what that's going to mean. But we do know this. God's hand is going to guide us. God's love will sustain us. And we will discern together how mercy is going to prevail, even over traditions and practices, to the glory of God and the spread of the good news. Amen.